All right, so this Delta flight 1661 starts rolling down the runway. They get an engine failure on the number two. They abort to take off. 1661, 12806, fly heading 300, runway 30, right, clear for takeoff. Heading 300, clear for takeoff, 300, right, clear 1661. 12732, Maple's Tower, runway 300, right, line of point. 300, right, uh, right, line of point, Delta 2732. Total 160 heavy, Maple's Tower, runway 300, left, line of point, just a slight delay for traffic departing off the parallel, traffic 6 miles long. Yeah. Just keep working around the corner, please. Wind to 2606, turn right, heading 320, runway 30 right, clear for takeoff. 320, uh, I'm heading 30 right, uh, Delta 2732, cancel takeoff, clearance, hold in position. I had uh, traffic abort downfield. They did a perfect job in aborting the takeoff. They maintained directional control, were able to exit the runway. Just perfect, perfect job. It's kind of nice to, uh, to see, you know, to talk about a video like this rather than all the typical YouTube death and destruction as far as aircraft uh, discussions go. Um, so when it comes to aborting a takeoff, there's really, there's a couple things I want to touch on. But number one is, uh, depending on what speed you're at, whether you're going to continue the takeoff or you're going to abort the takeoff, that discussion is based on what's called a V1 speed. Uh, throughout the takeoff roll, based on the performance data, there's V speeds. There's there you go, right out of the old uh, Airbus manual. There's V speeds. You can go ahead and read them if you'd like. That aside, there is the low speed regime and high speed regime, right? So we'll we'll categorize low speed regime anything between zero knots and 80, 100 knots, something like that. We'll just call it below 100 knots for the sake of the conversation. You're going to abort for pretty much anything, right? That is the flight attendants call you in the back. You get a master caution, master warning. Um, anything seems off, you can abort. No big deal because it's not that much energy to dissipate when the aircraft is going below 80 knots. Now, when you're in the high-speed regime between 80 or 100, depending on your airline, uh, and V1, which is typically, let's call it 125 knots, uh, you're not going to abort for anything. It's got to be something like an engine failure, fire, loss of directional control, something like that. If you get something, and this is actually an interview question, if you're, let's say, 110 knots and you get a cargo door open indication, are you going to abort? Um, I'm not going to. Some people might say they would, uh, but you shouldn't. And the reason why is because there's a much bigger threat aborting the takeoff that fast for something like a cargo door because 99% of the time, it's going to be just an indication. And even if the door is not properly sealed, the only thing that's going to happen is the airplane's not going to pressurize. So you climb out, you'll be able to look at the cabin altitude if you're at 5,000 feet, and the cabin altitude says 5,000 feet, then the door is actually open and it's not pressurizing. It's not a big deal. Everybody could still breathe. You run a couple checklists, you come back and land. Uh, when you're going 110 10 knots or 115 knots, possible loss of directional control, maybe not getting the aircraft stopped in time and going off the end of the runway. Now, when it comes to the must-go speed, that's V1, and that is the speed at which the aircraft will not be able to stop before the end of the runway. So after V1, you're going flying. You can have an engine failure, you can have a fire, you can have smoke in the cabin, whatever it is. After V1, you're taking it flying and you're gonna come back around uh, and, and you know figure out the problem in the air. So that's kind of where you decide whether you're going to go or whether you're not going to go. Now, you're going to know, uh, for the most part, what you're going to abort for because all of that is taken care of when you're at the gate. You're doing uh, a pre-departure briefing between you and the captain or you and the first officer or whatever. And that's where you talk about um, everything from, hey, we're going to push back. We're going to start one engine, two engines, you know, whatever it is. Threats. Uh, is it weather? Is the airplane? Is it a heavy takeoff? Is it a complex departure? Here's just a quick chart as an example of one of the more complex departures. The point is this in itself is going to take a couple minutes to review, set up, and make sure you understand it. So it's just one part of a potentially very long briefing that you have to go over, and it's just kind of part of the, the pre-flight process. So you kind of talk about all these things, and one of the things you talk about at, uh, at United, we have a, a literally a card that we just read off um, so it's much easier, all these bullet points to read off what you're going to brief. And one of them is the rejected takeoff. And you talk about not only when you're going to reject a takeoff, but who's going to make the radio call, who's going to do what. 
and what you're going to reject for. This way, there's no guessing. You know, the person in, in the captain's seat and the first officer's seat not only both know who's going to do what, but you're both going to know pretty much what you're aboarding for. And the standard across most airlines, uh, once you, you're taxiing out, right, uh, you want to have the airplane configured for takeoff. And there's a couple things in the aircraft configuration that you have to make sure is engaged or set for a rejected takeoff. And one of them is the uh, spoilers. Now, the 737, the 757, the 777 Airbus, they're all a little bit different in how they work, but ultimately you want to ensure that they are set automatic. Uh, so when you do, re you know, you bring the power back when you're rejecting takeoff, they're going to deploy automatically. And you can do it manually as well, but that just takes, you know, that burns a couple uh, seconds that might be valuable. The other is the auto brakes. You want to make sure that the auto brakes are engaged and they're going to work. So let's say, for example, we're about to take off, we're taxiing out. The pilot flying, it could be the captain, it could be the first officer, but whoever is the pilot not flying, so they'll be the pilot monitoring, they're the ones that are going to take a look at all of the engine indications, make sure everything is in the green, they'll look at um, exhaust, you know, first they'll, they'll look at the engine power to make sure that it's producing the power that it said it was going to, based on all the paperwork that you had in the flight planning, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you're going to make sure that the N1 is at the predetermined um, percentage, whether it's 100% for a full power takeoff, 75%, whatever it is. You're going to check for things like oil pressure, oil temperature, um, engine vibration, all of these things because the pilot flying, they're focused, out, they're focused outside maintaining the runway centerline, making sure no one's crossing the runway, flying the airplane, right? Now, any pilot, if there's any abnormality, they could call it, but it's ultimately going to be the captain who's the one that's going to make the decision to abort Usually, uh, if let's say I'm the captain, I'll say reject, I have control, I'll bring the thrust levers to idle or reverse, make sure that the aircraft is braking, a maximum brake, and if the auto brakes aren't doing it, I'll do it myself, and I'm going to maintain the runway center line with the rudder. The pilot monitoring is going to make sure that the engine, or excuse me, make sure that the brakes, auto brakes are engaged, that the thrust levers are actually, uh, the buckets are open and it's producing max reverse thrust, and they'll call out you know, one reverse thrust or two if it's a, a two-engine rejection. They're going to notify air traffic control that they're rejecting. And then you want to call out what's going on with the airplane for the uh, pilot flying so they're kind of aware of the state of the aircraft. And then once the aircraft is stopped, you're going to tell the flight attendants to remain seated at least for a second so you can kind of figure out what's wrong with the airplane, right? Is it, in this case, it was an engine failure. Now that the airplane stopped, is there an engine fire that you have to take care of because there's going to be memory items or checklists for that. And you want to take a look at the brakes because a rejected takeoff, the brakes are going to be well in excess of six, 700 degrees. And at some point, um, they're probably the tires are going to blow. They have these plugs where once it gets too hot, rather than the tires explode, uh, the plugs let go and the, and the wheels will deflate. So you might have a brake fire. So there's all kinds of things that you're going to have to um, think about. And I don't know if you guys remember, but a couple, a couple years ago, there was a Spirit A320 that took off out of Atlantic City or was attempting to take off. They had a bird strike. The engine caught fire. A takeoff turn terrifying. This Spirit Airlines flight lifting off in Atlantic City when a bird slammed into its engine. Deep black smoke, rising flames, and fear. Someone started from the back screaming, fire, fire. And there was a little bit of miscommunication, a little bit of chaos, and a bunch of people exited the airplane on the right side where the actual engine was on fire. So you have 180 people exiting the airplane, you've got fire, you have a wing that's got 15,000 pounds of jet A. So once the airplane stopped, you kind of kind of have to figure out, is the engine on fire? Do we have to contain it? And then you have to figure out, are the people going to evacuate? And if so, kind of you have to direct the flight attendants to direct aircraft right, aircraft left, whatever it is. So there's just a lot of things going on. And this the Delta crew did an absolute brilliant job. So it's kind of wanted to highlight that. Now, when I talked about V speeds earlier, where those come from, um, those speeds are going to change, and it depends on a lot of things. It's going to be the weight of the airplane, the length of the runway, the density altitude, um, so the weather's a factor. And then if you're doing a reduced power takeoff, a full power takeoff, all these different things, you put the parameters in the FMS, uh, which is the flight management system, the box we call it. 
and then you're going to send it, and then a couple minutes later, depending on if you use Aero data or Sabre or whatever it is, it's going to spit back your performance number. Here's my flight sim box, which works just like the, the actual real airplane, but it looks like that, and you just auto-populate it, you uplink it, and this is actually what it comes out with on the printer. Those are the actual speeds. There's all your data there, and it prints out. You look at it, you cross-reference into what's on the PFD in the box, and then you're on your way. So that's where we get those speeds from. But they're very important because you're going to abort or continue based on those numbers. And there has been instances in the, in the past where if you plug in the wrong data and you have wrong V speeds, you'll say rotate and the airplane's not going to get off the ground um, quite as quickly as it should. So it's a very important part of the pre-flight planning. But again, why it's important is because anything after V1, you're going flying, then that anything below 80 or 100 knots, you're going to abort for, and then like I said, that high speed regime, 80 to right before V1, it's got to be something big like an engine failure, fire, loss of directional control. And again, this is something that the crew will kind of talk about beforehand. Now, the only time, I want to say the only time I've had to abort a takeoff in the higher speed regime or close to it was uh, one of my first actually airline takeoffs ever. It was for Colgan. I was flying a Saab 340 for US Airways Express. I had dead headed down to LaGuardia for a broken airplane that was still not fixed. So we started rolling down the runway and on the Saab, they have this thing called um, CTOT, continuous torque on takeoff. So when it gets within 10, 15, I forget the number, 20% of the takeoff target, uh, it automatically does it so you don't have to sit there and kind of try to match the both engines by staring at it so it does it automatically. Well, in this case, uh, one of the engines caught to where it should have, it went up to 85%, whenever it was, 90%, and the other engine, it never engaged, so you had that asymmetrical thrust, which was pretty violent, and the air, airplane kind of headed for the weeds off the runway. We rejected the takeoff, and that happened twice, actually, where the system wasn't working. And then I don't think I've ever had a high speed, I know for a fact that I've not had a high speed uh, rejection on the Airbus or on the 7.3. And these are things that we do in the simulator and train form, um, and they're, they're called V1 cuts. Now you can have a rejected takeoff below V1 and you just kind of bring the aircraft to a stop and do the things that I talked about before. And then after V1, you're going flying. And we do it in the sim and essentially you just slowly, you know, you use your feet, keep the, the airplane on the center line, and believe it or not, you don't even have to go, if you have lose an engine, you don't have to go full power. And a lot of times it's recommended not to because the airplane's already destabilized. So if you were to go full power, it's even going to possibly destabilize it more. So it's got enough thrust to be able to take off and clear any obstacles on one engine, even at that reduced power setting. So we do that in the sim and it's just, you know, you maintain the runway center line with your feet. You slowly rotate 7 to 11 degrees. You get a positive rate. Gear up, when you're at acceleration altitude, you level off, uh, you pick up some airspeed, you clean up the airplane, and then you climb out, and then you do whatever you have to do as far as checklists go, and then you come back around and land. Um, you always do that in the sim. It's always like the one, the last thing you do over right before a type ride, so you, know, you get your heart rate going, but it's really not that bad, at least in the simulator. Um, love talking about this stuff, especially when it has a happy ending like this, because the crew did a phenomenal job. And speaking of Delta, this was also when I was at Colgan. I was doing the walk around in LaGuardia again, and there was a Delta 767-300, which is a massive airplane. It is a he it's a couple hundred thousand pound airplane. They were rotating out off of LaGuardia. I forget which runway it was, but I mean, literally right at V1, the number two engine absolutely just grenaded itself, and you could see the flames, parts coming out of it. They rotated took off, you know, barely. It felt like the end of the runway was, was you know, they were going to go off the end of the runway. It was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. This massive airplane taking off out of LaGuardia on a short runway uh, and these just absolute professionals getting on the ground safely. So it, it does happen, believe it or not, though it's rare, but it does happen. So uh, it's, you know, there's two, two Delta stories there for you, but it uh, just kind of shows how, you know, these professional crews, if you just brief this stuff and you know it down cold and you do it day in and day out when something like this does happen you don't necessarily need to think you don't need to think of what you're going to do because you've briefed it you've done it a million times in your head so you kind of just do what you had talked about on the ground back at the gate so um, just two really really good examples of just professional crews doing what they were trained to do and uh, getting the airplane stopped on the ground safely everybody off the airplane so um, great job to both those crews um I like talking about this stuff. I think it's interesting because you can apply a lot of this stuff to just your general aviation flying. I take off in the Cub. There's no V-speeds, but I'll go full power, 
and I'll check the RPMs, make sure that they're up where they should be. I'll check the oil pressure, not so much the oil temperature, but I'll check to make sure the airspeed is coming alive. So all those different things that we do at the airline, we you can do in generally aviation just based on a smaller scale. So always good to talk about, always good to kind of review this stuff. But, uh, you know, that's the thing about airline flying is you do, you know, two, three flights a day, uh, 15 days a month for 10, 15 years and nothing ever happens. And then, you know, one time it can happen and that's kind of when you have to be uh, on your game. But like I said, if you brief this stuff and you're prepared for it because you do it day in and day out, um, you should, you know, crews will have no problem, much like this Delta crew. They'll do exactly what they were trained to do, and everybody gets to go home that, that day and, uh, and see their loved ones. So, like I said, any questions, comments, concerns, if I confuse you or you have a question at all about, um, you know, the, the procedures from airline to airline or Airbus to uh, 7-3, leave a comment, ask me, and I'll, I'll gladly do my best to answer. All right, thanks.